Olá, eu sou o Miguel Cavalcante do Man in the Arena, estamos aqui no Case 2014 e agora vamos bater um papo com o Brian Hutchins da Gunderson and Detmer. Brian, thank you for talking to us. Uh, you talk a lot about how to prepare your company to receive international investments and also how to do the paperwork and to do contracts kind of thing. One of the first thing you you talk on your presentation was like put everything in writing and how often people don't do that because it sounds very basic but I know that a lot of people don't do it and you can face problems down the road yeah well it happens too often unfortunately especially with companies when they're first starting out um, so at when, when entrepreneurs come together to start a new business they're trying to do a million things at once build product hire a team raise capital So oftentimes they'll just shake hands on how to divide the stock or you know, what their different roles and titles might be and, and uh, put off actually putting that into a properly written legal document. And um, we've seen that happen more than once and down the road it, it came back to haunt them. And what's the minimum writing that you recommend? Like the just an email describing everything or what's the minimum? <laughs> well, it depends exactly what they're trying to accomplish, but when it comes to things like founder shares or equity, email is definitely not enough. Um, we've had some, we worked with some companies where the founders had email exchanges about how they were going to split the stock of the company, thought they all owned an equal share, and then a year later one of the founders decides to leave for whatever reason and uh, was shocked to find he actually didn't own any shares as a legal matter. That he actually, if this were to go to court or be enforced in some legal proceeding, he had nothing. And it was a very different discussion at that point when he was trying to leave um, about how much stock the others were willing to give to him. So. <laughs> okay. And also, you talk about vesting. Uh, if I'm a co-founder and I want to do a vesting contract with my other co-founder and he kind of not will, willing to do it, how would you talk and describe and persuade them, him to do the vesting? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would tell you is just have a really open heart-to-heart -heart conversation about your founder about whether that's the right match because we can write <laughs> everything that we want into the legal contract, but if there's not trust um, in a good working relationship, it's, it's still not going to work. Um, but what I would say from a legal perspective to that founder is, look, this is, this is here to protect you and it's here to protect me in case the world changes, you know, in case uh, a year from now or two years from now, I have to leave, it might be for family reasons, it might, be, it might just be because I'm tired or my financial circumstances change. And if I leave, you want to know that you know, I'm not going to keep an equal share that you have because you have to stay here to continue building this business. And the same will be true if the rules are reversed, so it protects all of us. But my, my, my feeling is that people would very commonly say, oh, that's fair, but it, it, this is not going to happen with us. Oh, I hear that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says that to us. <laughs> so how do you convince because, then anyway? Because like any marriage, it's yes, always yes. happening <laughs> at the beginning, right? They're yes. newlyweds and yes. they're excited and yeah. we're going to build this company, we're going to change the world, make lots of money doing it. Um, so I have to just remind them like, look, you aren't the first founders to come to our office and say that. All the, <laughs> all, all the founders who eventually broke up said the same thing when they were starting. So, so you have the benchmark. Yeah, so. So You know, odds are it will work out, we hope it does, but you got to plan for the other scenario. And talk, still talking about vesting, what's the extra steps or extra caution you need to have when doing vesting for employees or like people that uh, become part of the company after it's founded? For people who become part of the company after it's founded, it just... It, it just the cliff, one year cliff? That's usually, well, there are two differences that we see between founders and later employees. The cliff is one, so as you hire employees, it's common to have the 12-month cliff, which is a trial period. So if the employee doesn't work out and you have to let them go in that first year, that those options come back to the pool instead of going to that person. The other difference is acceleration, uh, change of control acceleration, which means that when the company is sold, some additional shares vest. We normally see that only for the founders maybe very top-level management. It's not something that's given out to employees generally. I see. Uh, also, uh, we talk about non-compete agreements. Uh, 
uh, what would be your like your internal thinking uh, deciding if a company needs a, a non-compete agreement with their employees or not? Well, it's it's tricky in Brazil because non-competes are actually hard to enforce. Um, yes. Generally, for your rank and file employees, you usually have to pay somebody severance in order to enforce the non-compete. So there's a cost associated with that. Um, but notwithstanding that, many of our companies still include them because they think that it just puts them in a stronger position when an employee leaves, if there's going to be discussions about severance or things like that, um, that ambiguity, I think, plays in their favor. So many of our companies include it. Can you, can you tell us uh, what, what are the most, like, two or three common mistakes on doing contracts, any type of contract, like non-competes or vesting or... Well, yeah, besides the ones we've already touched on, the, um, the biggest thing that we see investors get excited about is labor, class, like classifying workers as employees or contractors. And this too is tricky. Because for Brazil? For Brazil. Okay. This too is tricky because it's really expensive to hire employees in Brazil. And it's really expensive to fire employees in Brazil. But, um, but investors want, at least the U.S. investors want things done by the book. You know, they understand that it's going to be more expensive, but they think it will be better in the long run because there are going to be fewer risks for their investment. My understanding is like if you want to get like international investor, American investor in your company in Brazil, uh, you need to do that. Yeah. Is that right? If, if you're not doing it already, they will make you do it once they put their money into the company. Yeah. They okay. will. I mean, most of the, that's true. Most of the investors we work with say, I understand that that's how things are done in Brazil, but once our money comes in, we want you to do things by the book. Uh, if you could do a challenge for people watching the video, like a short-term challenge, something they can start to implement like until next Friday, what should you... What, short-term what, challenge? Yeah. Um, Not a short, but something they can like start to do until next, next week. Does it have to be legal related or...? You can... You, you, it's your challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm a big believer in, in goal setting. So, sets. yeah, set some stretch goals, you know, long-term stretch goals, and then break them down into weeks. And it could be related to cleaning up your house legally, like we've been talking about. It could be business development. It could be anything. But just take your long-term vision and break it down in incremental steps. So set a big step that's going to get you closer to that by next Friday and do it. Brian Hutchins, thank you very much for talking to Man in the Arena thank at you very KZ much. 2014. My pleasure.